Bob Ballou served many years as a professional scouter at the district, council, and national levels, where he was instrumental in nationwide projects, including being a critical player in the transition of the Knights of Dunamis National Eagle Scout Group to the National Eagle Scout Association, officially recognized by the National Boy Scout Council. He also contributed a great deal during the early stages of scouting's exploring programs move to be more responsive to the needs of 14 to 21 year old youth. After his professional scouting experience, Bob became a financial development consultant to multiple non-governmental organizations and then on to serve as the executive director of the Pacific Crest Trail Association, where he oversaw its membership increase from 800 to more than 4,000 people dedicated to protect, preserve, and promote the 2,550-mile-long Pacific Crest Scenic Trail. And welcome to this episode of Eagle Scouts Worldviews. Bob, we are so pleased that you're spending some time with us today. You've got some incredibly interesting stories to tell, and I'm looking forward to hearing them, as are the people listening. So welcome to Eagle Scouts Worldviews. And let's, if you don't mind, let's, let's dive right into it. Um, you've been in scouting, involved with scouting a long time, a professional scouter, all the way back in the days that uh, the scouting's headquarters were in New Jersey, correct? That's correct, yes. Yeah. And the interesting part is you are a player in the transition from the Knights of Dunamis to the National Eagle Scout Association, correct? Yes. Yep. Uh -huh. All right. <laughs> so far, I'm batting, uh, I'm batting a thousand. So would you mind talking to uh, the, the, the listeners a little bit? I, I doubt that many of them have ever even heard of the Knights of Dunamis and certainly aren't very knowledgeable about what brought the transition from that to the National Eagle Scout Association. So would you mind talking about that a little bit to us? Sure. Well, um, what brought it about was the launching of the Boy Scouts of America's Boy Power 76 program which was intended to bring the membership of the BSA from 25% to 33 and a third percent of available youth. And so there was a, a great need for retaining uh, older scouts to be in leadership positions and uh, particularly Eagle Scouts. And so the Boy Scouts of America had over years since 1925 uh, sort of tracked this organization. It was an honor society called the Knights of Dunamis. It was started uh, in 1925, as I said, uh, and it was designed. It was designed primarily to keep older boys in scouting, uh, in leadership positions, and in community service. It was very successful up until about the time of World War II, when Eagle Scouts uh, and other Scouts and others. Uh, were sworn into the military to do their duty to God and country uh, and went off to war. Uh, so things kind of died off there for a while, but they came back after the war and the original founders of the Knights of Dunamis, Dunamis being derived from the word power, the Greek word power, uh, and the slogan of the organization was power through service, uh, service to scouting and service to the community. Uh, the ceremonies of the Knights of Dunamis were based on um, Masonic orders, uh, which the scout executive that founded the organization had uh, uh, been a member of, and they were secret. They were, you know, secret passwords and regalia and so forth and whatnot. Um, the Boy Scouts of America, some of their sponsoring organizations had some real serious problems with that, uh, but the KD changed them, their ceremonies because they really wanted to be a part full bore of the Boy Scouts of America. And so structure changed over time. Uh, and in fact, the Knights of Dunamis even uh, was mentioned in the handbook for boys during the time that uh, I was a, a scout in the forties and the fifties. Uh, and it was listed as something for older scouts. Uh, well, in uh, 1968, when Boy Power was launched, uh, the chief scout executive, who was, like I had been, a national commander of the Knights of Dunamis, uh, invited me to come to the national office in New Jersey and 
help with the transition of the Knights of Dunamis to an, some sort of an Eagle Scout Association affiliated directly with the Boy Scouts of America, uh, sponsored thereby. And uh, that turned out to work rather well. Uh, I was a facilitator, frankly. I, I helped the Knights of Dunamis leadership uh, make the changes that they needed to make to accommodate the Boy Scouts of America and vice versa. Um, there was some reluctance at the Boy Scouts of America in certain quarters to uh, thinking that the Knights of Dunamis program would conflict with the uh, Order of the Arrow for older boys. And that had not been the case in councils that had the Knights of Dunamis. Uh, so uh, I got to the national office and found that Yes, the Boy Scouts of America nationally kept records of all Eagle Scouts. They were bound in a book, books, books, one book for every year with the name of the Eagle Scout, the council in which he earned it, and uh, his name, of course. Uh, but that was it. Well, the Knights of Dunamis, which I had been affiliated with since I had gotten my Eagle Scout back in 1958, uh, had a national newsletter that I was responsible at the national office for producing. And we sent those newsletters to our members in all the chapters across the country uh, with forwarding postage requested uh, on the face of the uh, mailing label. And that's how we kept track of these young men as they left home and went into the military or off to college or got a job in a far off country or land or part of the state or whatever, we kept up with them that way. And uh, so I was surprised that the Boy Scouts of America did not have any way at all to track these young men. So we sorted our membership list by zip code and then matched those zip codes with those of various councils and sent a list of all of our members in each council to that council executive to follow up. And they did so and were amazed at what they got in returns. So as perhaps you can feel from what I've been saying, the, the move from Knights of Dunamis to a National Eagle Scout Association was really more of an evolution than some uh, instantaneous moment. Uh, the name came about as National Eagle Scout Association uh, in the latter part of my being at the national office to see this transition through. Uh, and so really nothing changed a whole lot of, about what was done with Eagle Scouts uh, other than the name. Um, that was about it. The format was the same and that's how it worked. Yeah. Um, you did mention there was some hesitation, especially on the part of the scouting organization that, uh, that there may be some, some overlap or conflict with the Order of the Arrow. But did you note any any uh, pushback from folks that were associated with Knights of Dunamis saying, this is ours and, and we don't want to give it away to, to, to the National Council? No. No, there had been a long, this, this effort to become uh, officially a part of, other than just recognized by the Boy Scouts of America, been going on for years. Okay. Yeah. Hey, let's, <laughs> let's, let's switch gears just a little bit, if you don't mind. I've got sure. to tell you that I have never met an astronaut in real life, but you have, and not just an astronaut, but, but you met and, and, and had dealings with James Lovell of Apollo yes. 13 and, and, and other missions while he was associated with NASA. Just to satisfy my curiosity as a kid, what's it like to meet an astronaut? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm... I met a very fine man in, in Jim Lovell. He's, I think Jim's probably one of the most down to earth men I know, uh, no pun intended, uh, but he never let his Apollo 13 fame go to his head. Uh, but what did go to his head were the lessons he learned uh, on the Eagle Trail. And they saved lives uh, on Apollo 13. Uh, but I had recruited uh, Jim to be the chairman of a bicentennial camporee when I was in the Houston Council. Uh, it's a big council, about 16 counties. 
uh, and I was responsible for putting on this uh, this big camporee. Uh, and, we, and, and Jim, being an astronaut and having all those checklists those guys have to have, he helped me understand and, and work through all the little details, all the things that could go wrong, all the things we had to have backed up. Uh, and uh, one of the things that was my responsibility was find a location for this thing. We're talking about 5,000 kids in a, in a jamboree kind of a setting, three sub camps and an opening grand show and so forth. And I had tried desperately to find a space for that. And I told Jim, I was just having no luck at all. And he said, well, let's, let's go to the air. I said, let's go to the air, huh? He said, yeah, meet me at Hobby Airport on Saturday and we'll go looking from the, from the sky. So I and he uh, jumped into his twin engine airplane and off we went to go airborne and look for sites and we found one. Um, and the other thing that I was very concerned about was weather. Houston weather is, is terrible. Uh, and then uh, in April, it can be pretty nasty. Uh, but we found a weekend with the weather services help that it had never rained in Houston, but it did that weekend and we had a, a miserable experience. Uh, but there was Jim Lovell uh, walking through the campsite out. We had a torrential downpour. Uh, I won't go into all the details, but that's a whole nother story. But we, we had a torrential downpour and so the, here were all these kids and their gear and everything and the wind had whipped up and it was just a disaster. But Jim, bless his soul, traipsed through that entire campground, uh, all three sub camps uh, in the mud, making sure everybody was okay and thanking them for coming out and sticking with it. Just a, a great guy. Uh, and uh, in the it, when it was all over, I wanted to thank Jim for, for his efforts and he had told me that uh, in, the, in response to a question I had asked him how he got involved in space travel and so forth, that uh, he had done so by reading some books uh, that were by Willie Lay and Werner von Braun and illustrated by Chesley Bonestell, who I happen to have known. And in fact, over my shoulder here is a Bonestell painting. Uh, and uh, so I presented Jim with a lithograph of, of a Bonestell painting as a thank you for his efforts. And he in turn uh, presented me with the other picture that's over my shoulder, uh, in just a position to the Bonestell, uh, of the Earthrise picture taken from Apollo 8, on which he was uh, one of the members of the crew. And it was taken by uh, Bill Anders. But uh, he inscribed the, the matting, looking for camporee sites, and signed it Jim Lovell. <laughs> <laughs> As you were talking about Jim Lovell saying, meet me at the airport, he made that phone call to me on my way to the airport. I would have started scanning the horizon for a Saturn V <laughs> rocket to be pointed up. And <laughs> I'm like, how, how high are we going to go to find this site? That is a, that, what you have over your shoulder is just a little bit more exciting than an autograph on a, a restaurant napkin, isn't it? That is a... That is <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> you know, you, you yeah. had mentioned it as you were talking about him, you had mentioned, and in our pre-production meeting, you had mentioned as well that, that scouting has always been a, played a part and influenced your life, and it still is. And I wanted to ask this question, what does that mean that scouting is still a part of your life today in terms of how it influences you? Mm. Well, Mark, uh, I, have, I guess I would say that the scout oath and law have been my guiding principles since I memorized them as a Cub Scout, as a Weebelos. Uh, preparing to go into the Boy Scouts. Uh, you see behind me too, a uh, wall hanging. Uh, there are other guiding principles in, in everybody's life. Uh, the Ten Commandments, the Golden Rule, and, you know, wedding vows, <laughs> the like. But, um, you know, once those, those things are embedded in your head, they just don't go away. Uh, they, they were just, they're just part of me. 
uh, I, I'm just as an Eagle Scout, it's, it's what I am. Uh, you know, it's who I am. It's what I am. And it's, and I'm not going to change my stripes. Uh, I figure if people can't accept that I live by those principles, I can live without them. That's simple. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know which side of the fence I fall in, but it just came to me that that the scouting and, and especially Eagle Scout experience. I'm not so sure that being an Eagle Scout does or guides you in, in what direction to go, but rather guides you in what direction not to go. And um, there are some unscrupulous people out there in business and in industry and in, in you know, the, in the, in the public sector that do yes, things that, that would just, they're so far away from what I would think about doing. So I guess in my life, it's that uh, it, it built some guidelines of where not to go, as opposed to pointing me in a direction to go. Oh, that just yeah. came to me. Yeah. Listen, scouting has evolved a great deal in, in the over 100 years history that's been in this country. And it's based on foundational principles that are alive and well today. But I'm wondering in your experience, for a, a good portion of, uh, of scouting's lifespan in the United States. Have you seen a change in foundational principles? Have you seen societal influences as such that it's, it's difficult to, to, to keep hold of those uh, foundational principles? Or are they still alive and well in guiding scouting as they always have? Well, if the foundational principles are founded, are based on the scout oath and law, no, it hasn't changed. Its application may have changed somewhat with societal change. Um, I, I, I don't think the foundational principles of scouting have changed at all. Um, I know when I was on the national staff, I was my office was part of the exploring division. Uh, I was the assistant national director of exploring as well as the national secretary for the Knights of Dunamis. Uh, and this was a time when the Boy Scouts of America had listened to the Yankelovich uh, organization and was bringing about the, the change of exploring to incorporate girls into the career exploration program. And uh, so, that's a big change. Boy, that was fought tooth and nail uh, by a lot of the old time scouters. They did not see, there wasn't any wood smoke. Uh, <laughs> there was no camping. Uh, it just didn't make any sense to them, but it, it addressed the foundational principles of scouting. Uh, the, the oath was a little different for explorers, but that was a, a, a huge change for the Boy Scouts of America. Uh, and so there, there was a change, and it, but it, it had happened for the right reason, that young men wanted to know more about careers. They wanted to do activities with young women that weren't necessarily um, dating, like adults do in the workplace. Yeah. And so we changed, we changed and, and exploring grew like crazy. It was the largest growth of any program in scouting at the time. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and now we have a, we have a growth in venturing and, and help yes. me understand, perhaps I don't know the intricate ins and outs of, but it appears to me as though venturing is now following the, the course that, that exploring did with specialties yes, in high years. adventure or career exploration. So yeah. why do you, What's your take on why venturing came to be and uh, kind of is taking the place of exploring, although I understand exploring is now on uh, on its way back. Is that right? Yeah, the career exploring program is is coming back uh, in modified ways. But, okay. well, I think that there's a big word for you, biophilia. It is the human nature to want to be in nature. And... So venturing gets kids out and does what we did in ex when I was an explorer and an explorer leader, backpacking in the mountains and uh, you know doing things in the out of doors. Uh, and it, I think that you know, the kids today, I don't think it's necessarily related to the 
pandemic, but it might well be. I'm not, I'm not versed in all of that scientific stuff, but there's a longing, I think, in the human soul uh, to reconnect with nature, uh, to hear the birds sing and to touch and feel uh, the rest of the world out there outside of your digital device and your sofa. Uh, <laughs> so um, I think that sticking with the foundational principles uh, have been good for scouting and, and should hold true in the future. And this is, a, I, I don't know how much of a stray we're taking away from scouting and eel scouting in particular, but I, I'd like you to spend a few minutes talking about another phase of your life that had nothing to do directly with scouting. Uh, back in your college days that you, uh, what, you were instrumental in, in building a radio station. Uh, you, became, uh, you became involved in, in research with Stanford, I believe. It was it Stanford? That yes. Actually, uh -huh. That actually took you to South America for a while. Could you talk a little bit about those experiences and if the scouting, um, the, the internal orientation of self that, that yeah, scouting impacted, did that remain the same for you during those experiences? Um, yes, it, it really did. Scouting had a great influence in my life, a, a, a huge influence. Uh, I was active, of course, as a scout, as an explorer, as an as a young adult leader, jamboree, assistant scout masters, and stuff like that. Uh, but my family moved from San Bruno, California, to Palo Alto, California, when I was a sophomore in high school, and uh, I wanted to get a summer job between my sophomore and junior years. I worked out that. Uh, uh, but a lot of my classmates were getting jobs out at Stanford University as lab assistants during the summer. So I, uh, I returned from my backpacking trip. It was the latter part of June and I started looking for jobs. And of course, they were all taken by that point. But I had a chance interview with a professor at the Radio Science Laboratory. And uh, he asked me uh, if I'd had any photography experience. I didn't know where that was going necessarily with that question, uh, but I told him that yes, uh, we had a dark room at home because my dad and my brother and I were all amateur photographers and I had just taken about a couple hundred slides, color slides uh, uh, on our backpacking, on our Boy Scout backpacking trip. At which point he said, oh, I'm the scout master of the Stanford troop. Did you know that? I of course was shocked wanted to know what rank I was working on. I was working on life, I think, at the time. And uh, he needed somebody to work in a dark room processing uh, films that were taken of, of oscilloscopes. It was very boring. Um, but the dark room was a disaster. He hired me. Uh, I told him that, that the dark room was about to collapse. Yeah, the sinks were rotting out and all the rest from the chemicals. and. Uh, so he told me to figure out what it would take to get it right, and price it out, and bring me a, an estimate of what it would cost, which I did. The work was done, and uh, I had a great summer. Uh, I turned 16 that fall, uh, and uh, yeah, I think scouting had a great influence on my life at that point. Uh, if he hadn't been the scoutmaster of the Stanford Troop, I'm not sure I would have gotten the job, but uh, it wasn't the end of my my Stanford and scouting odyssey, if you would. Um, I w after I graduated from high school, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. And uh, in the fall of uh, 1958, I guess it was, um, 57, Sputnik went up. So I called my former boss out at Stanford and, and asked him if there was uh, something related to Sputnik that he needed help with. He wanted to know when I could be there, and I said, you name it. He said, be here after lunch. And I was after lunch for five years um, working for Stanford, which led to my trip to South America uh, to maintain, install and maintain a data acquisition station at the very tip of uh, South America at Ushuaia, Tierra del Fuego on the Beagle Channel. In the, in the 60s, in 1960, it was a pretty primitive place. 
but I did that and uh, I maintained that station there. And during that, whenever I had an R&R &R, uh, to go back to Buenos Aires for a little rest and relaxation, uh, I, I stayed with the, uh, the family of the uh, U.S. Naval Attaché to uh, Argentina and they had a 12 year old Boy Scout. And there was a Boy Scout troop, a US Boy Scouts of America troop there that had both Argentine and American kids in it. And uh, so after a few months of getting to know them and going camping a couple of times with them, I put together a cross country expedition of Tierra del Fuego uh, for the older boys in the troop and the Argentine Navy flew the kids down. And uh, we had a, fantastic backcountry experience. It was all wilderness, uh, very the trails. There weren't trails, <laughs> there, there simply weren't. We came across old Indian uh, lodge poles and, and lodges and so forth. But yeah, um, uh, that was a scouting experience that uh, I'll never forget. Now, as you were talking, I realized a while ago, I was impressed with Jim, Jim Lovell, an astronaut. And now you kind of uh, you kind of impress me the same way that his history did as well. <laughs> hey, no, I'm just a just a guy. Just a guy. Hey, uh, we're coming down to the end of our time we have available today. But I'm wondering if you have anything you'd like to say to folks who will be watching this video in the future. The microphone and time is all yours. Hmm. Well. This is Eagle Scouts worldviews, right? I, uh, I was thinking about that last evening as I was watching the news, the world news. What a mess. What a mess. I, I, I remembered last night the Kingston Trio song. That I think the first line was, the whole world is festering. Da, 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 da. I don't remember all the words. I just remember that. It's so true today. The whole world is festering. How different, Mark, how different would the world be if all the nations of the world leaders were Eagle Scouts and living by the Scout Oath and Law? Now, is that Pollyanna or what? You know, but... <laughs> But all of us as Eagle Scouts, since that's who we're talking to today, if we get involved, become involved in our local communities, in our states, in organizations that do good works, we can make a difference. Uh, we really can. Everybody can make a difference. We're, we're coming up on an election year. We all need to vote, vote our conscience, vote for those that we feel will follow the oath and law, um, you know, and, and look at the scout oath on my honor. I'll do my best to do my duty to God and country to obey the scout law, to help other people at all times and to keep myself physically strong, mentally awake and morally straight. Uh, helping other people at all times should be every Eagle Scouts motto our mantra, if you will. Uh, you know, if you live by the words of the Scout Oath and Law, as I have certainly tried to do, you can't go wrong. So th those are those are immortal words. They'll always, they'll always help you do the right thing. So that would be my parting thought. And thank you. And that is one uh, wonderful postscript to this interview. Thanks so much for your time. We appreciate your being here with us today. Um, and uh, as I, uh, as we talked before, I think I'm going to have you on the show again in the future to talk a little bit more of the history of the Knights of Dunamis, if you're willing, still willing to do that with me. Be happy to. Outstanding. Yeah. Hey, thanks again for your time. We really appreciate it. And folks, that will do it for this episode of Eagle Scouts Worldviews. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time around for our, uh, our next guest. Have a good day.